Hey guys, it's Dr. Z. Welcome to the Z-Dog MD Show. Today I have a guest that I've been wanting to talk to for a long time, and it just so happens with everything going on with the COVID pandemic, this is actually the perfect time. So this guest and I were supposed to meet in person a little later, and now with the social distancing and everything that's changed, we're gonna move this up because his work on mindfulness, on anxiety, on how we can watch our minds with curiosity instead of losing ourselves in the primitive fear response is so timely right now, especially for frontline healthcare professionals who are wa walking into situations where they're terrified every single day. Uh, and so let's just cut to the chase. Uh, Dr. Judd Brewer, is the Director of Research and Innovation at the Brown Mindfulness Center. He is a psychiatrist and PhD by training. This guy has done everything relating to mindfulness and the study of how science and neuroscience can actually correlate with the benefits and aspects of meditation and mindfulness that uh, we, many people now talk about and take as a given. He's done the, the earliest sort of functional MRI studies looking at the brains of adept meditators and how they change uh, from those parameters. He's the founder of Mind Sciences. Uh, is that right, Judd? That's right. My, and this is Judd, by the way. Uh, Mind Sciences, which uh, creates app-based interventions that can actually help with anxiety, addictions, eating disorders, things like that. So we're gonna talk about that as well. Uh, let's stop talking about it and just get into it. Judd, thanks for coming on, man. Oh, thanks for having me. Man, and I, you know what, it's funny. I think we're roughly the same age and have a very similar sensibility about the world. Um, my mom's a psychiatrist and you are a psychiatrist. So there's gonna be transference and, 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 and issues like that, just so you know. <laughs> Great, let's get into it. <laughs> where, where are you based, by the way? Where are you right now? I'm at, so my, my day job's at Brown University. Um, I live in Massachusetts because my wife's a professor at Holy Cross in, in Worcester, Massachusetts. Got it, got it, got it. And how, just to, to get people up to speed, how did you get into the space of mindfulness? Because so many doctors kind of have historically blown it off as some woo-woo, you know, new age garbage. And you and I know better. I myself have been trying to meditate for upwards of eight years with varying success. And I find it so central to my sanity and also to my, the sanity of my family because I'm much better around them when I have a meditative practice that's stable. How did you even get into this stuff? Yeah, it was a, I totally tripped into it. I was um, scheduled, scheduled. I was uh, aiming to marry my college sweetheart and we'd both uh, gotten in the same MD PhD program. And then we broke up uh, as we signed leases for apartments. Uh, we were going to uh, Washington, St. Louis. Um, these are for apartments like the summer before we started school. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah, so I lost my my best friend. You know, we dated for years in college, and um, I was having trouble sleeping because, it, you know, she wasn't that excited about uh, that. You know, we had planned to be together, and then we weren't. Um, you know, the long story short, we we were not probably not meant to be together. We're both happily married to other people, but I was, you know, beginning medical school. I was having trouble sleeping, and the first day of medical school, I was thinking, well, this is a new beginning for me, so why don't I try meditating? And so first day of medical school, I started meditating. Oh, well, actually, that's not fair. I started listening to these things called cassette tapes. Maybe oh, you remember what those are. So are, were, those, were those the sequel to 8-tracks? Because that's how I was rolling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so listening to cassette tapes of meditation, um, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, uh, you know, I'd, I'd gotten his book, Full Catastrophe Living, and so really what I did was I fell asleep for about six months trying to listen to these meditation cassette tapes <laughs> before I could stay awake for a full half an hour to meditate. <laughs> ah, that, that sounds very familiar. And I think mo many of my um, uh, audience members, when we talk about meditation, the first thing they say is, man, that just puts me right to sleep. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a challenge initially, but uh, so you push through that. I did. And, you know, I found that it, it, during boring medical school lectures, I could actually do something productive by practicing meditating. <laughs> so instead of focusing on the breath, you were focusing on the droning voice of the sage on the stage going on and on about <laughs> phosphate, dehydrogenase, whatever the heck it is. Yeah. Totally. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And but you stuck with your practice. 
Yeah, I did. I, you know, relatively quickly, I learned that it was actually a really good way to help me de-stress and help me be more focused. And so I stuck with it. You know, within a couple of years, uh, I was starting to go on long meditation retreats. I had a daily practice at that point. And during my PhD years, you know, MD PhD is great because you, you do two years of medical school and then you do your PhD for as, as long as it takes to forget everything you learned in medical school. And then you get thrown back in the wards and have to like try to remember. So I, I had this opportunity for what, six, seven years to really get a, a solid foundation of, of meditation. Then I started back on the wards and something really amazing happened where, you know, I actually, I was like, oh, I'll do psychiatry as my first rotation because I'm never going to be a psychiatrist <laughs> and can throw that one away. <laughs> right, here uh, I am. Yeah. But I, I saw something really interesting because I had learned a little bit about how my mind worked, which I never learned in medical school. Uh, and I didn't, you know, didn't, not my PhD years was about, you know, learning how the brain interacts with the immune system and things like that. So I, I learned enough from my own personal practice that I started to see patterns in my patients in the psychiatric clinics. And I was thinking, wow, these guys are using the same language that I was learning in these mindfulness practices. Is this a coincidence? And so I actually had a great rotation and I was thinking, wow, I can't wait to get to the rotations that are going to be really good. And of course, you know, nothing, nothing really uh, resonated as well as psychiatry. And I, I saw two pieces there. One was that in psychiatry, you know, there aren't a lot of great medications, um, you know, because we, we don't really know the brain mechanisms that well yet. And, you know, it, universally targeting something like serotonin, of course, isn't going to give you specific effects. No, duh, right? Yeah. Um, so one, we don't have great medications in psychiatry. And two, I was seeing that these ancient Buddhist psychological practices were actually describing things exquisitely, even better than any of the theories that I'd learned in medical school and even in residency. So I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take this plunge and I'm going to shift my career to studying mindfulness. I don't care if I totally fail because at least I'll fail doing something I love. And people, I was at residency at Yale, people were like, Oh, this guy, you know, you know, he's bonkers. And so they'd start socially distancing themselves <laughs> in a different way. <laughs> wait, wait, I got to interrupt you. For, okay, first of all, I'm so, I'm, this is, you're living the life I should have lived because I've been so fascinated by this stuff that I was like, I should have dedicated my whole career to this early on. And you actually had the chutzpah to actually do it. And I bet you that your classmates were like, oh, Judd, he's that guy. Like, we all know he's going into psych, right? Because he's the guy who's just a little bit off and like goes on these meditation retreats and it's a little woo woo. But it's in reality, you're, you know, you're like, oh, the, the, when the Buddhist uh, lexicon talks about grasping and aversion, when it talks about the hindrances to you know, happiness and, and meditation, those are the same foundations of addiction and depression and, you know, anxiety. Is, is, that, is, is that the conclusion you came to early on? Oh, absolutely. So we, I actually published, I met a guy who was a former Buddhist monk. Uh, his name is Jake Davis. And we got together. Wait, 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 there was a, uh, wait, wait, a Buddhist monk named Jake Davis. Like it yeah, sounds he, such he a was, bro was name. Great, he had, he was, he grew up in, in the East coast, but then had gone to Burma to be a monk for, you know, for years. Wow. And, and then had come back and, and had disrobed. And so his, his <laughs> back to his normal name, <laughs> Jake Davis. <laughs> Um, but he also had this, he is, he's a brilliant guy um, and ended up getting a, a PhD in philosophy. Um, but one thing that we started to explore through conversations was that there's this concept called dependent origination in Buddhism, which is really complex and it, it was really hard for me to understand. But when I started seeing parallels between that and modern day learning around operant conditioning or reward-based learning, I was like, wait, this cannot be a coincidence because they're talking about the same thing. Wow. And so we actually wrote a paper. We published it in 2013 in, I think, Psychology of Addictive Behavior, where we show that the Buddhist psychologist actually scooped Skinner you know, before <laughs> paper was even invented. <laughs> so we, we showed that these things line up perfectly. Um, and you can actually distill it. The more I learn, the more I see this really distilled into its, its core elements to the point where we're using that as a foundational piece for all of our app-based trainings going forward. We can get into that in a bit, but historically, that was the first thing that I started to notice. And I also started to notice this, even with things like a borderline personality disorder, which was something where I had to memorize this list of stuff and I couldn't, you know, how do I deal with these patients? I really, I, I really struggle. 
and I found everybody it struggles, Judd. Like I'm, I'm splitting right now just even hearing you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we were, I wrote a paper, on the, a scientific paper on this, how a borderline personality disorder actually makes a lot more sense if you view it from the lens of reinforcement learning. Because if you look at these issues, you know, a lot of them have childhood abuse. Uh, parents were out, you know, often uh, alcoholics or some other had some other substance use disorder. And what we find is that they are intermittently reinforced because their parents come home and they don't know whether they're going to beat them or love them. So they had to form these protective mechanisms to literally stay alive often. And that this forms this insecure attachment where they're constantly, you know, their dopamine's constantly jacked. So they're looking for dopamine hits, which is why people with borderline personality disorder are more likely to do risky behaviors, to gamble, to have substance use disorders. All that fits because it, they're just trying to get their dopamine because they haven't formed stable attachments. Wow. Right? So we could even see this play out in, in, with borderline personality disorder. And it also per, gave some very simple answers and explained some of the simple practices that I was taught, which is like set clear boundaries with your patients. If I set clear boundaries, it gives them a stable attachment, even if it's I'm only going to see you from this time to this time, you know, once a week or whatever that is. So that started to fall into place for me. And especially this is why Winx is studying addictions. That made complete sense because, you know, it's well known that addictions are perpetuated through operant conditioning or through reward based learning. Right. And so we can see how that fits. We can link that up with Buddhist psychology and then we can start to see how all of this comes together and actually how you need one simple ingredient to, to hack that reward-based learning system. I actually just put a short animation together on my website that describes this. Uh, and we can get into that in a minute if you'd like. Uh, wow, so lots to unpack here, that's amazing. So first of all, talk, that is a very cogent description of borderline personality disorder. Um, I, I've had many borderline patients. I think I may have borderlines in my extended family. It, it's, it's a challenge, right? And so that's a nice framework and it also allows for a compassionate response from people who f get very triggered by borderlines and have a lot of transference and this kind of thing and it, whatever the technical term is. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I play one on YouTube. And as you know, my mother being a psychiatrist, uh, I would hear a lot of this lexicon when I was young. But now, so, but one thing I wanna make sure you explain especially to me, because I'm interested in this, because I hear it a lot, is this, is this theory of dependent, you know, the, the, the principle of dependent origination. And I want to clarify something for people who don't understand this. I'm gonna look right at the camera when I say this. When he talks about Buddhist psychology, he is not talking about religion. He is not talking about belief. He is talking about the aspects of Buddhism that were the science of the mind of its time. So do you agree with that as in terms of what I'm saying? Yeah, the Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. He was a psychologist, really. Right. You know, he's a scientist. You know, this guy Goenka described, who's this famous meditation teacher, described him as a super scientist mm. because he figured all this stuff out without torturing graduate students or lab rats <laughs> or having computers or anything. Like, he just sat down. Maybe he wasn't distracted by his cell phone <laughs> so he could concentrate. You, you, you shut up, Judd Brewer. <laughs> 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 yeah, he just sat down and looked at his mind and he actually mapped this thing out. So the uh, there are 12 links here, but I don't think it's helpful to talk about all, all this stuff. I think it's helpful just to look at the core elements. So basically some um, <clears throat> something comes into our mind. You know, I think of it as, a, as an event. It could be something we, anything through our five senses or a thought, right? So that comes into our mind and it gets interpreted either as pleasant or unpleasant. Uh, let's use a concrete example. So let's say um, I see a piece of dark chocolate, okay? That comes, or I smell dark chocolate or whatever. That comes into my mind and it gets interpreted as pleasant, right? And then I want some dark chocolate. So that pleasant or unpleasant leads to wanting. And then we behave accordingly, right? So I eat the chocolate. And then that um, behavior has a reward value. If it's pleasant, I want to do that more. And so it reinforces it, lays it down as a memory and says, when you see chocolate again, you should eat it. The same thing is true if I get yelled at by my boss, for example. And so that unpleasant feeling says, I want this unpleasant thing to go away. And my brain says, I have a great idea. Why don't you eat some chocolate? And it will go away, right? Or if somebody smokes, uh -huh. go out for a smoke and you can get away from the situation. All these things. So that's basically um, what, what operant conditioning is, as well as dependent origination. They're describing the same thing using slightly different language, but it is exactly the same thing. That, that, so, so that makes a lot of sense, especially in the capacity of uh, talking about addiction and this idea that 
each, so, and, and it's interesting because I, I use a book called The Mind Illuminated, which is a great sort of Vipassana meditation manual uh, by this guy, John Yates, and he was a neuroscientist as well. And so his um, way of looking at it is you have this raw stimulus from the world that then is processed by your mind system, these little sub-modules of your mind. And so auditory processing starts to process it, then it's fed up to the discriminating mind, which connects it to a recognized thing. That's a bird. The sound is a bird sound. That Then it adds a hedonic spin to it. So that's good, bad, or indifferent. Okay, yeah. then it connects to the, the conditioning part. Well, do I wanna do that? Now I'm gonna grasp for it, or I'm gonna avert it, or I'm gonna want one, or I'm gonna kill one and stuff it and keep it, but it's never gonna be enough because my brain wants that hit of dopamine right it does that sound roughly correct absolutely absolutely yeah. and you're hitting on something really key which is dopamine is there to actually lay to help us lay down context dependent memories right so it was there it's set up to help us survive so if you see food that's the trigger you eat the food that's the behavior and then your stomach sends this dopamine signal to your brain that says remember what you ate and where you found it uh. But there's a really critical piece here. So that's reward-based learning in a nutshell. And that's basically dependent origination in a nutshell. But what dopamine firing does is it shifts from receipt of, you know, of reward, or I shouldn't say that. It, it shifts from like when you do the behavior to anticipating do the, doing the behavior. So if you always go back to that food source, your dopamine firing goes down and down and down and stops firing when you actually eat the food. But what it does, it starts firing before you get the food that says, go get food, right? So it becomes this motivating factor. Mm. So when somebody first takes cocaine, for example, and they get this dopamine hit, it says, wow, you should do that again. And then people think about cocaine or this is just as an Substitute example. anything, yeah. Right. They just think about it. And then their dopamine fires and says, well, why are you just thinking about it? Why don't you go get it? And we get off, our, get off, off the couch and go do that. Same for food. Same for our smartphones if we haven't checked our social media you know, feeds lately. They, they all work in the same way. And, and you know, honestly, uh, <clears throat> as a hopeless addict to my phone, because I largely now make a living based on you know, putting things, trying to educate via social media. And so I love the slot machine pull effect of refreshing a feed and seeing, oh, what's the response? What are the comments? What, what have people thought about this piece of knowledge we're trying to put out in the world and it's so addictive that I find it it takes over my consciousness and it, to the point where now being on you know the social distancing where I'm stuck in this space without proper human contact beyond my family it's debilitating because it leads to this sort of cycle of thoughts and and uh, anxiety and so maybe this is a good chance to talk a little bit about that in the in the context of covid and then we can get deeper in the weeds on on some of that other stuff yeah, so there are several aspects that are very interesting to think about with regard to what's going on right now. One is, let's start with the news and social and, and um, being addicted to news, for example. So in the, in, just in the distant past, before there was this thing called COVID, I don't know if anybody can remember what that was like. The B BC before COVID? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, so, which was like, what, three weeks ago? Three weeks ago, us, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. So the news cycle was mostly just, you know, stuff that was, you know, we kind of had a sense for what the news cycle was. There's politics, there was environment, there was business, whatever. But now there are big stories that hit all the time, but we don't know when they're going to hit. Mm. So if we've gone 12 hours, say, without, like, let's say we've slept. Okay, let's be realistic. Somebody has slept a full four hours before <laughs> they wake up early because they're anxious. We can right. talk about why that is. Right, too. I did that this morning, yeah. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I've been waking up early yeah. as well. So somebody goes a full four hours and they check their news feed. There's probably very like it's very highly likely that they're going to have some big news story hit. So that fires dopamine in their brain. So then they say, well, I need to check the news in five minutes. And of course, five minutes later, there's not new news because they, you know, it's it's been four hours and that news hit sometime in those last four hours. Well, look at it. Five minutes, okay, let me check again. Five minutes later, five minutes later, five minutes later, boom, big news story. Sound like a casino? Sound uh, like a jackpot? Sound like uh, a slot machine? Uh, yeah, that's what's happening. So when there's enough big news that's happening a couple of times a day, we're intermittently reinforcing ourselves unknowingly uh, to do that. So 
the first thing for people to realize is this is a time where people are going to get much more addicted to the news. So it's really important for them to step back and see how that process is working. Hmm. If we know how our minds work, we'll be able to work with them. So understand that your phone is your slot machine. Decide whether you want to get addicted or not. The next thing that we can do is very simple is to is to just limit ourselves, say, to twice a day. You know, so if you check the news twice a day, it's likely that it's right now that there's going to be a big news story. So every time you check the news, it's going to be big. So you don't get that anticipatory um, surge in dopamine and you don't get that big dopamine firing when there's something crazy that happened because you can guarantee something big is going to have happened. So it becomes regular. And then it's important to start dialing it back as the news cycle starts to dial back as well. As things start to calm down, we can, you know, dial it back to checking the news once a day. Because honestly, for most of us, we probably don't need to check the news more than once a day. Absolutely. I mean, all of that makes sense. And I think one thing you said that's very important is we need to recognize how our mind works. And I think that's the central piece that I think we're getting lost in the sauce, as the kids say. I don't think any kids say that, Judd. Um, (laughs) But I like to pretend that I know what the kids are saying. Is that tight? Is that pretty fresh? So, but the bottom line is when we, when we don't know how our mind works, we get lost in thought, we get lost, we identify with anxiety, we identify and we forget that we're doing this and that we're trying to refresh and we're thinking about the news. And then we're wondering why on a conscious and unconscious level, we're deeply unhappy. So waking up at 4 a.m., it, it, to me is my unconscious mind saying, you're worried about all kinds of things and trying to feed right. it up and it's it's, pulling me out of sleep and I'm getting up and, and then I'm realizing, and then I meditate for half an hour and I'm free. I'm at, and, and the contrast, the contrast is so dramatic. Actually, I just got to tell a quick story. I, I, I might've told this before, but it's, it's, it, it's illustrative of when you watch your mind and you just go, oh crap. So, you know, COVID was descending. I had just read the Imperial College of London. So I've been on, I've been talking about this for a while now, Judd, we're trying to basically be a voice of calm reason because as clinicians, right, we look at this and we go, okay, it's a severe pneumonia. It's mostly affecting older people, but it can affect younger people. We will get through it. It will be very hard on the healthcare system and people will die, but we'll get through this. This isn't the worst thing that could have happened. It could have been a lot worse. And so I'm looking at bright sides and I'm going, okay, we've been through similar things that aren't as bad, but we'll get through this. Then I read the Imperial College of London report, the original one that says, we're all going to die if we don't, I mean, more or less, I'm paraphrasing. We're all gonna die if we don't do draconian measures for 18 months, shut all life as we know it down. Otherwise, this is never gonna end and millions are gonna die. And that very night, so that that changed my mindset from, okay, we're gonna get through this to we're all, oh my gosh, did I miscalculate this? Like, have I been telling the world the wrong thing, right? And so. At that point, my mind is a mess. I'm anxious, I'm like snippy, and I'm socially isolated just with my family. So who bears the brunt of it? My family. So the kids are like, we wanna watch a movie. I'm like, there's no time for movies. We're all gonna die, right? Fine, we'll watch Toy Story 4 because Disney Plus let it out because everybody's stuck at home. So I watch Toy Story 4 with the kids and I get lost in the movie. So in other words, my sense of self, my little limited ego, all of that disappears and I'm part of Woody's story in resounding 4K and the emotion of it and the beauty of it and the love of it. And I was like so lost in it. When the credits started rolling, I kind of snapped back and suddenly you felt the social contagion of COVID just go right back. And feeling it descend and the way it made me feel I got mindful in that moment. I stepped out and I said, that's it, there it is. That's the effect of this social contagion and anxiety on what was otherwise a pure conscious state of just awareness of this movie. And seeing that then woke me up and I'm like, okay, I need to do more of that, the awareness part and less of the getting lost in the sauce. Yeah, so let's let's unpack that. There are a couple of things that it's really helpful for people just to understand, which might also help them see how things like you're doing are, are really helpful. So the first piece here is you're talking about this fear, right? And so we have this primal fear that comes up. It's a normal survival mechanism, right? It helps us remember, you know, where the danger is in the savannah to avoid that place. And so, like you're saying, the COVID-19 is a very dangerous virus. So that's a real thing. So that's our survival brain. But on top of our survival brain, we've evolved this neocortex. And in particular, the prefrontal cortex that's part of that is involved in planning and thinking. What the neocortex needs is accurate information. 
So in the absence of accurate information, fear plus uncertainty equals anxiety. So you just describe that beautifully. It's like, oh, you know, this could be terrible. On top of that, so fear plus, uh, plus uncertainty equals anxiety. You take anxiety and you add it, you add in the ingredient of uh, social media, and then we can get social contagion, right? So you can, you can stop the spread of COVID-19 by socially isolating, but somebody could sneeze on your brain from anywhere in the world, right, with social media. Sneeze on uh, your brain. That's what they're yeah. doing. Yeah, that's what they're yeah. doing. So when that happens, we panic. And not to say that you were panicking, um, but I you're was. describing <laughs> elements. Okay. That night I was. That. That, that night I was. By the way, just to clarify, so since then, I, reason and prefrontal cortex came back online. And I was like, no, 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 no. Actually, there's a lot of brightness here and optimism that we can do this. And it will be hard. But there's no reason to panic. And that's what I'm telling people because it's true. And that's how I feel. But for that moment of panic, you're absolutely right. It was panic. Please continue. Yeah. Sorry. So prefrontal cortex offline. So those elements are all there. And if we can just understand that, it's easier for us to spot it so that we can step out of whatever's perpetuating it. You know, if we're on social media and people are sneezing on our brains all day, we're like, wait, wait a minute. Oh, now I understand how this works. Maybe I should take a break from social media for a while. <laughs> Duh, right? Duh, right. But if we don't see it, we're just going to be sucked in, right? You know, denial is the first step. In, oh, man. In, in, yeah. Man. So, so on top of that, let's add in... Let me just ask you, is anybody around here worried? You know? No. Okay. So hypothetically speaking, let's just say that somebody might be a little worried right now. So people can just bear with me here for a moment. So worry is a very interesting thing here because it also gets negatively reinforced. Now, yes. So worry can become a habit. Just let that sink in and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Worry can become a habit. So negative reinforcement, you need a trigger, a behavior, and a reward. So if you, you know, if you get yelled at by the boss, that's the trigger. You eat the chocolate, that's the behavior. And then the reward is that you get that dopamine hit from the chocolate and you feel a little bit better. So if the trigger is fear or anxiety, we can actually do mental behaviors as well. And mental behavior of worry is one that people are very, very good at. And what that worry does, there's this guy Borkovec at Penn State who studied this for decades. Worry does two things. One is it helps us feel like we're in control and also helps us avoid the worst feeling, feeling of anxiety or fear. But the problem is when our brain figures out that worrying doesn't actually help us get in control, it starts to feed back and become this negative feeling, feeling in itself. And then it just starts to spiral. We go over the event horizon into the black hole of anxiety. So worry can actually be perpetuated when in reality, it, you know, it was trying to help us do something because we're like, oh, I have to do something. I have to do something. Why don't I just worry? Mm. <laughs> well, worry is not only perpetuating itself, but it's also making our prefrontal cortex go offline. So we can't actually do things that are productive or helpful. That, so you're like the Stephen Hawking of anxiety. Right, you're just describing black hole radiating worry sucks you in, and then you're stuck into the singularity of anxiety where you, even light can't escape. And in fact, so it, it's it's interesting. There's oh, there's so much here, Judd. Like man, oh my god, I think about this stuff a lot, and I'm like an amateur. I'm an amateur psychologist, right? Like I'm, I like read John Haidt, and I'm like, I know psychology, right? And I, it's elephant and writer, and you know, uh, the the writer is our prefrontal cortex trying to exert strategy, but it gets fatigued and it goes offline, and then it's all elephant, it's all primitive, limbic, fear, those kind of responses. And I think right now, socially, we are living an elephant life, like it's just anxiety and chaos and fear, and I see it because I get thousands of messages from frontline folks that are just paralyzed by fear. So you ready for this? So the first step is understanding how our minds work, right? So seeing this, it's actually a relatively straightforward process. We can see when we're caught up in worry. What, we, what my lab's been doing, and you know, I'm a clinician, I wanna help my patients. And so instead of just feeding them medications that may or may not work for them, I wanna understand what the psychological mechanisms are. And so we ask the question, well, can we actually, let's, so let's take your, your rider and, and elephants or rider and horse or whatever analogy there is out there. You know, the rider of reason trying to, trying to hold on to the reins of the elephant, which is much stronger, right? And so we can see this in our primitive survival habit, um, habitual behaviors. They're much stronger than reasoning. 
So we can't think our way out of a bad habit. Otherwise, anybody that wanted to quit smoking would just say stop smoking and they would stop doing it or just stop eating the cake and we'd all eat salad instead. Right. So we can't think our way out of a bad habit, including worry. But what we can do is understand the mechanisms and hack the heck out of our brain. I'm still trying to think my way out of this, man. I'm like, how dare you tell me, Judd, that I can't think my way out of this? I'm going to think my way out of this right now. Okay. Okay. I'm stuck. Now I'm more anxious. (laughs) All right. Teach us the hack because this is the key. This is like a metacognition. This is like stepping out and going, okay, how do we hack this thing? Because there are millions of people that are going to get something out of that if they can figure out how to do that in this environment and any environment where worry, anxiety is a loop of destruction for them. So hit me with it. Yeah, so this is for any any habit or any type of worry. So anything that's perpetuated through reinforcement learning. So there's a part of our brain called the orbitofrontal cortex that stores reward value. Uh, I think of it as the BBO part of the brain because it's always looking for a bigger, better offer. Hmm. Okay, so all of our brains have these reward hierarchies set up. I'll give you just give you an example of mine. So uh, milk chocolate is low on the reward value. And then there's like 70% and then there's 85% and then there's, you add a little sea salt and maybe some cayenne pepper, you know, and it gets a little fuzzy up here, but that's definitely better than milk chocolate. So when given a choice, I'm going to pick dark chocolate over milk chocolate any day. And what that does, it helps us. I think of this as set and forget. So we set a reward value and we can forget about the details so that we don't have to relearn behaviors every day because otherwise we'd be exhausted by breakfast, right? Mm. So we set up all these habits and then given a choice, we're like, oh, I'll have the dark chocolate. And then we can free up our brain to do other things like trying to think our way out of anxiety. <laughs> so, so we have this reward hierarchy and what awareness does is it hacks the reward system in two ways. One, it helps us see really, really clearly how unrewarding old habits are. I'll give you an example. So I had a patient uh, who I started seeing about six, six months ago who was referred to me for anxiety. <clears throat> and um, he came in, he was pretty anxious, didn't he? I just looked at him like, okay, you've got anxiety, what's next? Well, he walked in the door and he described how he started to develop these, um, these pa- have panic attacks on the highway, where he said, I feel like as I drive in my car, I'm in a speeding bullet. And so the trigger would be he would have this thought The behavior would be he would stop driving on the highway. And the reward was that he would not have those bad feelings of worrying about getting in a car accident. Now, he never got in a car accident. He just started worrying about that. And panic disorder isn't a disorder until you start worrying about having more panic attacks or until you start avoiding things so that you don't have those panic attacks. So it's not the panic attacks themselves that are the problem. It's the panic. It's the worry about the worry. The anticipatory uh, worry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this guy comes in, uh, he's totally flustered, has no idea what's going on, you know, he's tried everything. And so we just map out uh, some of his, he had plenty of things to map out around, around habit loops around, of anxiety. And so I said, I gave him our unwinding anxiety app and I said, okay, just map out your mind, just start there, come back two weeks later and let me know what you discover. Oh, and this guy was 185 or 180 pounds overweight, um, had high blood pressure, fatty liver from obesity, all this stuff. So he comes back two weeks later and he sits down. And the first thing he says is, oh, I lost 14 pounds. And I look at him like, I thought we were focusing on anxiety. And he goes, yeah, I mapped out these habit loops. And I realized that I was eating as a way to cope with my anxiety. And it wasn't doing it for me. So I stopped doing it. So that's the first step here is just paying attention, mapping out these habit loops and seeing that eating as a way to cope with anxiety doesn't work. So that reward value dropped for him. And he became less excited to do it in the future, and he stopped doing it. We've done this with smoking, where we've trained people in mindfulness. Um, In our first randomized control trial, we got five times the quit rates of gold standard treatment. Because when people pay attention, when they smoke a cigarette, they realize, oh, shock, it tastes like shit. Right? Cigarettes do not taste very good. Yeah. Um, So you can do this for all sorts of behaviors. Overeating, same thing. So that reward value drops, and then that opens up the space for something better, for that bigger, better offer. And what I would suggest is that curiosity, so a curious awareness, which is the core of mindful, mindfulness, bringing a curious awareness to our experience actually feels better than some of these things themselves. So you tell me, this might be a hard one, you, you should think your way through this one. So what feels better, anxiety or curiosity? Oh, it's going to be, I had to think about it, curiosity. <laughs> 
How about how about a craving or curiosity? Mm. I think, boy, I think a curiosity would be better because a craving, yeah. you, you get anxious. Yeah. 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 So there's this restlessness. That's that dopamine hit that's saying, go do something, go do something. Whereas curiosity, it's like, hey, let's just explore what's happening. I don't have to go anywhere. So the curiosity itself is that bigger, better yeah. offer. Yeah. So and- I'll, I'll give you an example. We just finished a clinical study uh, with our Eat Right Now app. We have this eating app. And we, what we do is we embed this craving tool right into it where we can actually measure reward value in people's experience. So there's these, these uh, researchers in the 70s, Rescorla and Wagner. They have this whole model where it shows that reward value determines whether you're going to do a behavior or not. So at baseline, we can ask people when they have a craving, we can have them imagine um, you know, how strong is their craving and we can have them imagine eating the food, whether it's eating junk food when they're stressed or overeating. We have them go through and imagine eating it. And if somebody's still really excited, you know, about doing that, where that reward value is still high, their craving is going to stay high, which is fine. It just sets that, you know, helps them see what their baseline uh, reward value is. Then we have them go through a mindful eating exercise and we have them pay attention as they eat. And there are two things that happen. One is if they overeat, we then ask them, how content do you feel? And they're like, wow, that didn't feel that great which then gives them what's called a negative prediction error in their brain, where they were predicting that it was going to be this rewarding. They realize that it's not. And that negative prediction error is exactly how their brain learns. Okay. So that negative prediction error feeds back to the next time they have an urge to eat. They imagine it, they bring up that reward value from their memory and they realize, oh, it's not that great. And it's easier for them to stop doing it. Within 10 to 12 times of people doing this, we see a significant reduction in reward value and it predicts future behavior. Oh, so, okay. All right. I think I finally understand this. And, and so, because <laughs> if I think about things I've quit doing in the past, right? Mm-hmm. At some point it clicks in my mind. You know what? I'm not really getting anything out of this. Why am I continuing to do? Yeah. And, and, and my reward value drops, but I get at it through luck and brute force, like, and, and just time, like, ah, crap, you know, I feel so crappy eating this garbage. Why am I still going to Burger King? Cause I like their bacon King. Uh, and, and, but every time afterwards, I don't feel good and I'm gaining weight and I don't feel good about my, why am I doing this? And then it kind of slowly short circuits. But the question I have, Jed, because what you're doing with your app is you're, kind of training people through repetition and through a process that you've designed. Because what I find the hardest part about that is maintaining the awareness and the discipline to be aware of the lower reward value and all of that. Because we get, again, we get lost in the uh, in the conditioning, in the habit pattern, in that energy. Right, so here it's really, I find it really helpful to use whatever people are struggling with to train them with that. And uh-huh. so instead of tr- trying to, uh, do something to maintain that awareness, I say, okay, you have a, if you have a craving, let's use this as a teachable moment, right? So when they have that craving right in that moment, they can bring awareness in and suddenly, you know, they can start, they can pay attention. It walks them through an exercise to do that. And that decreased reward value is really, it just happens spontaneously because their brain sees really clearly. And so all of this the only thing that the only ingredient that this thing really needs is awareness. As we bring awareness in, that reward value gets updated, and also awareness itself, that curious awareness, feels better. So, okay, fantastic. When you talk about awareness, is right because that that term itself is is steeped in uh, lore uh, in the meditative circles. When you talk sure. about it, you're talking about in the sense of the curious, mindful witness where you're saying, oh, you know what? No, I can actually see what's happening here. Be aware of it as opposed to having it unconsciously happen and just uh, not paying attention to it. So it's a more selective use of your attention. Is that how you're using the term awareness? Yeah, basically pay attention when you're eating, pay attention when you're smoking, pay attention when you're worrying. I don't, you know, it's very pragmatic. It's not some esoteric definition of consciousness or awareness. It's basically, dude, pay attention when you smoke. Dude, pay attention when you yeah. um, when you eat that third piece of cake. Yeah, um, yeah. And what this does, you know, the, the thing that's really blown me away is, you know, these Buddhist psychologists, before paper was even invented, they came up with this theoretical concept But it was really, so I think of this as concepts in the service of wisdom. Mm. So a conceptual framework 
can help somebody. So you're talking about, you know, you're, you're basically talking about monkeys typing Shakespeare on typewriters, right? So if you got a, had an infinite number of monkeys and an infinite amount of time, you would get Shakespeare out of random chance. You're talking about your random chance of, oh, you know, eating garbage, this and that, because there wasn't a conceptual framework. What I'm suggesting is we can just give people a very simple conceptual framework, which is here's, you know, here's how reward value works. And that conceptual framework can then be combined with their experience so that they develop wisdom and wisdom is unshakable. You know, nobody, you, nobody can convince you that something is, is you, that you realize doesn't taste very good is good. I'll give you an example. I, I totally lost my taste for gummy worms. I used to eat the whole bag at once, you know, cause I was like, well, at least I'll have a tum- stomach ache at the end of the night, but at least they won't be here tomorrow. Mm. And I started paying attention as, as I was eating them and I realized, wow, this really doesn't, these don't even taste very good. It's like kind of like some petroleum product, you know? That's right. And when I compared them to something like blueberries, now I'm in love with blueberries, like fresh blueberries. Yeah, they're really good. To die for. Yeah. My brain's like, dude, why would you eat, why would you eat petroleum when you can have blueberries? And so for me, I can never go back. It's just my brain just won't do it. You know what's funny about that? And I I heard on all points there, food that is um, processed and constructed, like let's say a McDonald's uh, Big Mac or something, versus food that is whole and natural and whatever. Mm -hmm. If you actually pay attention when you're eating the processed food, it will taste like chemically garbage. If you stop paying attention when you eat processed food, it is the best thing in the world because it is designed to trigger all those unconscious drives to eat more of it. Whereas the opposite is true with whole food. If you just pay, if you don't pay attention to real good food, you're just eating it and you're like, ah. But if you pay attention to it, you're like, oh my God, feel the texture of this and the beauty of it. And yeah. So let's unpack that a little bit because I love how you say that. If we don't pay attention, it's the best thing in the world. And I think we can actually see that if we don't pay attention, it's just driving, it's tapping into our survival mechanisms, which are dopaminergic, restless, don't feel good. And so we might think, and a lot of people equate dopamine as this happiness molecule. I would love to disavow that people Ah. of that notion. It is not true. Dopamine is a drive molecule that drives us to go do behavior. Anybody that says that, um, you know, feeling restless and antsy you know, that feels better than feeling peaceful and calm. Forget about it. They're, you know, they're, they're, I don't know. I, I would love to find somebody that's like, yeah, please, you know, jack my dopamine system more now because I feel so calm. And oh, you, oh, no, sorry, sorry. You mean every ER doc? Bro, bro, <laughs> bring me a busload of nuns, diabetic nuns who just overturn, man. That's like, that's Tuesday for me. No, no, no. But I hear exactly what you're saying because in true, it, your, dopamine doesn't lead to happiness. It is that it is that it leads to the craving for what you think yeah. is happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just did a, a, a body, um, you know, kind of a body description where you kind of closed your hands like this. So let's get into how this fits with the sense of self. Are you ready? Oh, I'm now. This now you're speaking my language because, so as we all deep know, space here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need, we need Carl Sagan to narrate this. Billions one, okay? and billions. Yes. <laughs> oh, by the way, quick Carl Sagan story, just because. So I grew up in Clovis, California, outside of Fresno, California, tiny little place. Carl Sagan shows up to Fresno State University. I'm in high school. I'm a huge fan because I'm a big nerd. I show up. I sit in the back row with my friend who's like this stoner, like metalhead guy. And he's like, who is this guy, bro? So we sit there. We listen to him. And I'm just waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. He says, billions and billions. And I stand up and I start hooting and I clap. <laughs> And the entire auditorium is just like, huh? And I'm like, who are you people? Are you fans of Sagan or not? I, dude, it was, it still scars me. Talk about negative dopamine. This has nothing to do with what you were talking about. Back to the sense of self. <laughs> That's a great, that is a great story. Well, so just to line that up, it was so emotionally shocking for you, you still remember it. I right? do, because yeah. that's what dopamine does. It says, remember this. <laughs> Thanks for salvaging that story, you know, from a, from a scientific standpoint for me. <laughs> that's you that was about to get hit by a bus that says, don't step into the street again. <laughs> Never do that again, exactly. And look, you did okay. <laughs> ah, you know, that's a t- don't, talk, don't talk to my parents about that. They still, they're still mad at me for doing whatever it is I do. But. So, so the sense of self. 
Right. So you you use this this description of a of contraption. You 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 closed your hands together. So tell me, when you're craving or when you're anxious, mm-hmm. does it feel more closed down and contracted, or does it feel more open up and expanded? Mm-hmm. It is a, const- a contracted, constricted, very self-oriented state, like me against the world. Yeah. How about joy? Joy, a true joy, is an expansive yeah. bliss of connection and love for me. Okay, so how about connection then? I'm guessing connection that- is similar to joy. True connection. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so if you take that contraction, that is a marker of a sense of self. It says, here I am, and the rest of the world out, is out there. It just gives this, uh, this boundary between us and the rest of the world. So if you take that boundary and you start to expand it and expand it and expand it, eventually you lose a sense of where you end and where the rest of the world begins. And this is where, you know, like Mihai Csikszentmihalyi talks about flow. Yeah. Where there's no sense of self. You are just part of everything that's just happening effortlessly, joyfully, you know, all of that, timelessly. So we've actually studied this using fMRI. You ready for this? Come with it. <laughs> so we studied experienced meditators. This is back in 2011. We published a paper in PNAS about this where – we just, in a cross-sectional study, we just wanted to see what was going on in the brain. So we took novice meditators and we took experienced meditators and we taught the novices three types of uh, practices, breath awareness, one called loving kindness, and one called choiceless awareness. We had them, you know, we compared their brain activity. So the first thing that we saw was a complete flop in terms of I had hypothesized that there was going to be some brain region that was increased in activity in experienced meditators. Because I certainly felt like I was working when I was meditating. This right. is back before I actually, you know, for the first 10 years where I was totally flailing. Striving, and, yeah. <laughs> striving, yeah. yes, I was striving. Actually, I had a meditation teacher on a retreat say, because she was probably so flustered, she's like, well, your your path to enlightenment is through striving. <laughs> she didn't know <laughs> she just gave up, right. <laughs> <laughs> so here, you know, you can think of that as... Um, You know, these, I was expecting this brain region, some brain region to pop out as being increased in activity. We didn't find a single brain region that was increased across the entire brain Mm -hmm. in activity. Mm -hmm. When we looked at the opposite, we found something really, really interesting, which was experienced meditators decreased activity in in two hubs of the default mode network, which were the medial Mm -hmm. prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex. The default mode network is, a, is probably one of the most well-known networks now because it's involved in self-referential processing, right? So anytime we think about ourselves in the past or the future, we're activating that network. Anytime we have a craving, we're activating that network. Basically, anytime we're getting caught up in our experience, we're activating that network. We pub- I published a paper on this with uh, Sue Woodfield Gabrielli, who's a default mode network expert at MIT. So here we're seeing that this you know, this experiential sense of self is lining up with getting caught up in our experience and maybe a marker of, of that experience of self. So now let's link, does that make sense? Absolutely, and in fact, if you, if you look at uh, the effect of psychedelics as well, right? Very similar uh, quieting yes. of default mode network, expansion, loss of sense of self, loss of ego structures. And uh, having experienced that myself, I can say it is a, the truest path to a kind of blissful state of oneness that you can find. And if that involves shutting down default mode network, then uh, that's worth doing in some way. Yeah, so they, it's funny you mentioned that because two months after we published our first paper, Robin Carhart Harris, yeah. uh, University of College London, published his first paper in the same journal on psychedelics, and they found it's psychedelics are like throwing a hand grenade in your brain and throwing, uh, blowing up the default mode network. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so it's a mar- It can show you what that is, but meditation and mindfulness are ways to train you to go there yourself. And what I would now suggest is training to go there is simply by hacking our reward-based learning system where we can see how unpleasant getting caught up in craving is and how pleasant it is to let go and simply be with this stuff. So I'll give you some examples. We just finished an NIH-funded study of uh, people who wanted to quit smoking. Mm. This was in collaboration with, uh, with Amy Janes at Harvard where we scanned people. She has this great paradigm where she shows people smoking cues and it activates their their default mode network like a Christmas tree, right? It, mm. So we can scan, we can bring people in who want to quit smoking. We can scan their brains at baseline, and then we can randomize them to get app-based mindfulness training. So we have this app called Craving to Quit, 
oh, we could randomize them to get the National Institutes of Health, the National Cancer Institute's Quick Guide app. A month later, we can bring them back in, scan them again, and see if changes in brain activity predict clinical outcomes. So we can bring this concept together around mindfulness that helps people let go. We can uh, train people in that using an app, and then we can see if, if it affects clinical outcomes. Lo and behold, we find that there's a strong correlation between a reduction in default mode network activity and a reduction in cigarette smoking. There's even a dose-dependent relationship, but this is only with the mindfulness training group, not with the control app. Only. It's super clear, super clean, super pristine. We published this in neuropsychopharmacology in 2019. So, boom, right there, we're seeing this play out clinically. Wow. So you can think of this. The more we get caught up in craving, the more that's going to drive us to do more behavior. But the more we can bring curiosity in and ride out cravings, not only does that curiosity feel good, but we actually start to hack our brain to where we start to get in control. And you can think of letting go as the ultimate form of control, right? Because when we let go, we don't have to worry about trying to hold on to the reins. We become one with the elephant, so to speak. We, and so we can literally, as we learn to let go, we see that, oh, it's much easier to make decisions. And it's much easier to make decisions when we see how unrewarding these old behaviors are. So when they saw that how unrewarding smoking was, it was much easier for them to let go. When our folks with using our Eat Right Now app saw how unrewarding eating was, we got a 40% reduction in craving-related eating. Are you ready for this? Worry and anxiety, you can do the same thing. Mm. We just finished a study with anxious physicians. Well, oh, you okay. mean, oh, sorry, just, just say physicians because it's the same thing. <laughs> Funny you mentioned that because this was the easiest study we ever recruited for. It oh. took a single email. Uh, this was at uh, University of, of Massachusetts Medical Center. Wow. Single email by the CEO there, and we got all the subjects we needed for this study. Unbelievable. It doesn't surprise me at all. If you'd put it on my platform, you would have had 20,000 people sign up. <laughs> yes, yeah. So we all know what this is like. So we, we were looking to see if mindfulness training, so we have this Unwinding Anxiety app, and we, you know, one of the barriers to entry for physicians is they're like, oh, I don't have time, right? We, we wear this badge of honor of, of I'm, I'm the martyr, right? Yeah. So on television, do you ever see physicians going to the bathroom? No, right? Because they don't have time to go to the bathroom. They're saving lives. <laughs> Uh, see, I go to the bathroom while I'm saving lives. I just, I wear a, I wear a Foley catheter and a diaper. I, I mean, say, yeah, yeah. You cath yourself oh, on your yeah, chest. That's yeah, yeah, of course. No, I, I oh, no, I don't cath myself. What do you think? I'm crazy. I have a nurse do it. Well, <laughs> sorry, go on. <laughs> your st your study. <laughs> It's good we don't I edit these. I need to pull yeah. Stephen Colbert. Uh, yeah, yeah. There it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, what we did. <laughs> Sorry, that was hilarious. Oh. All right. So phys anxious physicians. Right? Yeah. So the, the other thing with anxious physicians is, I don't know about you, but in medical school, I learned the old school way of, you know, <laughs> be tough or die, you know, armor up, right, right. You know, don't show weakness. Yep. And so, you know, we didn't, we didn't learn anything about how not to be anxious. We just stuffed it in the closet. Right? Heck yeah. Right. Per so, rectum. Yeah. Shock. Why are there so many physicians that are burnt out now? Well, because we don't know how to handle our emotions. No tools at all. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. No tools. So all of this stuff comes to the fore. And we figured, okay, what can we do so that physicians can have something simple where it only takes a couple of minutes a day for them to practice and they can actually practice this in their, while they're going through their, day, their busy days? Because people actually learn better in context, right? People don't learn to get anxious in my office. So can I package my office and deliver it to them through their phone? Mm. So we cut this training into bite-sized pieces and we, you know, we really helped people start to map out you know, their anxiety habit loops and their worry habit loops, and then learn to work with them in context, right? They see how unrewarding it is to worry, how rewarding it is to be curious and connected with their patients. You ready for this? 57% reduction in clinically validated anxiety scores. We use the GAD7. 
50% reduction in callousness in the Maslach burnout inventory. So they're even reducing burnout without us mentioning the word burnout once. Well, now, okay, <laughs> those are amazing numbers. I got to ask the elephant in the room question here. Was there a single surgeon in your study? Because that, that would skew it. <laughs> like, so it, it was all it was all specialties that actually experienced this amazing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. The only requirement was that they were actually seeing patients. Right. And that was the only thing. Right. So that, I have to go back and look to see how many surgeons. Yeah, you need you need to do a subgroup analysis, Judd, because yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, like, uh, no, no. All joking aside, that is remarkable, and it tells you first of all, you know what, you know what though, because it's interesting you're picking low hanging fruit with anxious physicians because like like you said that we don't have the tools so you've given them yeah. the tools and and I think that's very promising I'd like to see then that study play out in people who have maybe more tools um the average population well okay so oh yeah we just finished another study oh, that was boy. funded by the NAA here we go so we I we told you you were a gunner with- before we started the show <laughs> We did this study with people with generalized anxiety disorder ah. uh, because it's one of the hardest anxiety disorders to treat. And, um, you know, for me as a, as a physician who prescribes medication, the number needed to treat for anxiety is 5.15. So for folks that don't know what that means, mm. you basically we're playing the medical lottery, so to speak, with, with treatments. And so, you know, if you treat five people, one person benefits. So, it, you know, if you take this medication – on average for anxiety, the likelihood is you have a one in five chance that it's gonna help, right? So that's the baseline. So we said, okay, let's take that and then let's see if, compare that to giving people this unwinding anxiety app. 63% reduction in GAD7 scores, in clinically validated anxiety scores. And so two things here, one, the number needed to treat there, 1.6. Wow. So I'd rather play that lottery. Um, no side effects, no copay. Don't need a prescription from your doctor. You know, well, people can just download it. But Judd, I want a pill. I don't <laughs> want to have to work. But ser- that is remarkable. And and so the question I have relating to that, because you know, I I, I listened to uh, Feeling Good, the cognitive behavioral book uh, on audiobook, and. So how is this different than, say, cognitive behavioral therapy, where you're looking at thoughts, you're recognizing distorted thinking, you're applying antidotes, you're journaling, that kind of thing? How is this different than that? Right. So cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is, and I love, I was trained in CBT in residency, actually by a Beck-trained psychologist. So I had really good training there. So my one-line distillation, CBTers don't hate me for this is um, catch it, check it, change it. But you just described that, you know, recognize distorted thinking, bring in antidotes um, to change the behavior. So this is helpful for a subset of the population if that have a prefrontal cortex that works well, as in anybody that's like Mm. Mr. Spock, right? Mm. So for for the rest of us, most of us, our prefrontal cortex goes offline when we're stressed. Mm. So it's gonna be really hard to utilize cognitive tools when we're anxious, so especially for people with anxiety um, and, and panic and things like that, you can't rely on the rider here because the elephant is too strong. Mm. So you have to actually tap into the elephant. So we actually looked at the mechanism and we said, okay, what's going on? 63% reduction, that's pretty good. Randomized controlled trial, you know, really good results. So mechanistically, what we found was that increases in mindfulness skills mediated decreases in worry, right? So worry spins out and perpetuates anxiety. Decreases in worry mediated decreases in anxiety. So we actually have a behavioral mechanism for how this is working. Got it, it makes perfect sense. And and, and again, I think what you said is important. I found cognitive behavioral therapy to be very useful, but it, it is mentally taxing. Uh, so, so it uses a lot of ATP in the prefrontal cortex, and if that fatigues and goes offline, then you're just all elephant. So, I, what I love about awareness-based meditation, mindfulness, is that you your elephant can be raging, out of control, and all it takes is one moment of metacognition where you just watch it rage and you be with it as it rages, and you hug it while it's raging, and you accept it while it's raging, but you don't become it while it's raging. So, oh, so, so that's beautiful. So, typically, we're, we're pulling on the reins and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. What you just described is learning to flow with the elephant itself, right? And there's Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's concept of flow. Being, we become one with the elephant. 
cheesy. <laughs> but there it is. Uh, it's a very P.T. Barnum kind of a scenario. Well, you know, and the reason I can speak this way about it is just this morning I had a flow state experience in meditation. I, I told you I woke up at like four. I was super anxious. And it's all the COVID stuff and a lot of work stuff and a lot of other stuff, just unconscious roiling, right? So I said, okay, today I'm going to do a choiceless awareness, lock Kelly style of meditation. By the way, I heard you on Sam Harris brilliantly done. I love what Sam does with meditation. So it was an open awareness, uh, ch just choiceless being with what is. And in the process of warming it up, I entered this kind of flow state where it was just things were happening and I was in the now being with them as they happened and bliss and expansiveness and joy. And then I was able to carry that into, it's my wife's birthday today. So I was able to carry that into being nice and connected and loving towards my wife who's having a birthday that got basically canceled by COVID and my kids and all that. And it, and it, and it's, it lasts through the day. So this is real. I'm not a, I'm not a smart man, but I know what love is <laughs> to quote <laughs> Professor Gump. So you, you ready to jump in there then? I love how you're talking about that because that's another bigger, better offer that we haven't talked mm. about yet. So let's talk about that and how that's that, how that could actually be something really critical for us right now. So there's this psychological concept, you may have heard of it, which is a uh, thaw shift refreeze. Have you heard of this? No. Okay, so I learned this in college. So basically think of a leaf frozen in a pond or a lake, right? And so in the spring, the sun's rays and the warm temperature um, unfreezes, the, unfreezes the leaf and then it can shift around. Yeah. And then in the winter, next winter, it's going to refreeze. So it could refreeze exactly where it was or it could refreeze somewhere else. So right now, COVID-19 is that energy that has thawed our collective, you know, divisiveness, uh, racism, sexism, all the isms, right? We have been frozen like that forever, way too long. This has thawed us out and we're actually learning what it's like to work together, to be kind to each other, to support each other. That as a bigger, better offer, the more we see how much togetherness feels so much better than being separate and divisive and uh, co competing, the more we move that leaf into a very different part of the pond so that hopefully when this pandemic is over, we can never go back. This is what kindness is. People, I love, there's this one of my favorite poems, uh, Naomi Shihab Nye wrote this poem called Kindness. And she talks about a couple of things. One, before you can know kindness, you have to lose things. Mm. Well, guess what? We have all lost a whole bunch of stuff, mm. or even if it's just normalcy, right, of our mm. lives. Mm. So it, what that does is it helps us see the size of the cloth, as she puts it, where we're all in this together, right? And when you can see that, then you start to see, as she puts it so beautifully, it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. <laughs> because when you see how painful it is to be mean or to have been the recipient of somebody being unkind, and you compare that to being kind or being the recipient of kindness to our brains, it is a no-brainer. So it is up to us. We have thawed as a society. It is up to us to really just bring awareness in and pay attention to any time somebody's been kind to us. Pay attention any time when we've been kind to somebody else, not as a pat on the back, but just how good it feels to be genuinely kind, to be genuinely generous. And then to lock that into our brains as that I'm never going back because it's to our brains, it's got to be that no brainer. That's that's what's going to be, what, what did Martin Luther King Jr. say? You know, that is going to be the salvation of our civilization. He was talking about agape, you know, the brotherly, yeah. the, the love for each other. Yeah. That will be the salvation of our civilization. And that is the biggest, most better offer that I could imagine. And I think that is a perfect way to wrap up our show because I'm running out of card. I could talk to you for three hours, Judd, seriously. And, and next time I'm gonna get an extra card and we're gonna do that if you'd come back. Because th these are the conversations, honestly, that get me going because this is the hope for how we can do things better, both individually and culturally in the setting of chaos and struggle that will be inevitable, right? Pain is inevitable. 
suffering is optional because it's all relating to your resistance and how you're with that that pain. And 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 talking to you today has gotten me woke to it more than ever, and I think the audience will be woke too. Give me a call to action. Tell me about where we can find your app and your research and other things like that. Sure. So I've got a website, drjud.com, drjud.com. I've actually been inspired by others uh, who are being so generous with their time. I'm actually starting putting to put out daily YouTube videos, just short five-minute segments oh, to help great. people understand some of this stuff and give them mindfulness practices so they can go to my YouTube channel. Um, it, the app that I talked about is Unwinding Anxiety. Uh, it's unwindinganxiety.com. Our eating app is goeatrightnow.com. Nice. I'm <laughs> ready to eat. And if somebody wants to quit smoking, it's just cravingtoquit.com. But really, they can find everything through my website. Drjud.com. Yes. And that, I'm on Twitter. They can hit me up on Twitter at Judd Brewer, J-U-D-B-R-E-W-E-R. I'll, I'll put all the links in our description. Dude, thank you so much. I, I One thing I try to... Let me make sure I have enough space there to say this. Yes. One thing... Without Logan here with the social distancing, it's hard for me to get the tech act together. Um, I've been trying to focus more on gratitude, which I find mm-hmm. is so powerful, right? It, 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 that, that's it, you did it with your body, that's what it is. When you feel and you count the blessings instead of the negatives, and I did this exercise with my wife the other day because we were feeling covish. That's my term for uh, the whole COVID-19 social contagion. We're like, man, what's going on here? Oh, you know? And uh, we're like, wait, let's think of all the things that have gone right that we are so blessed to have. And it's an expansive, beautiful thing. Covish? Covish and compassionate, <laughs> grateful Yeah, I don't know what the I opposite is. But, and, and so I'm so grateful uh, that, um, that we were able to connect and we were able to have this conversation. It really changed the tone of, uh, I think, the conversation that I've been having a lot, which is just, okay, how are we gonna get through this crisis? Well, now it's like, okay, everybody take a breath. We're gonna do this and we'll do it together. So thank you, Judd. Um, will you come back on the show in the future? I'm going to come hang out in your garage when we don't have to socially distance anymore. Darn straight. That's the only thing that's helped me from getting killed by uh, anti-vaxxers is the social distancing either. They can't come within six feet of me, which is great. Um, So, dude, thanks again. Everybody in the Z-Pack, do me a favor. Leave a comment. Tell us what your practice is, what you're grateful for. Um, Go check out Judd's stuff. We'll be talking more about this. And become a subscriber. Click the little bell on YouTube. If you really feel it in your heart to support us to with the work that we're trying to do uh become a supporter on youtube or facebook or patreon it really really helps us and our supporters are the greatest all right guys i love you be kind to each other and we out peace